Hi, I'm Neil Peterson. I'm a forest ecologist at the Harvard Forest um, since 2015, maybe 2016. Yeah, I think it's 2016. No, it's 2014. My gosh, it's been a long time. And uh, this is a talk that I've been invited to give by Dr. Mary Arthur of University of Kentucky and Beverly James of Floorcliff Nature Sanctuary for the uh, field class, the forest ecology class that they're going to have at Flora Cliff. And the best basic topic is to understand what old trees look like, uh, what we can learn from old trees, dendrochronology, uh, the dynamics of ecology a little bit, and the dynamics of learning. And so with that in mind, I want to introduce you to myself again, starting here. Um, this is where I grew up on the left. This is uh, the old farm that I grew up on. Um, this is north of Syracuse. This is Volney, New York. Uh, my parents were elementary school teachers. By the time I came around, um, you know, we, my, uh, it was a time when you could still afford to buy 90 acres and an old farm on a single salary of a of an elementary school teacher, my dad's salary. My mom started staying at home to raise us four children. But this is the environment that I grew up in. This is the environment that I played in outside all the time, winter, spring, summer, fall. Um, and on the right, well, you know, a little bit later, before there was color in the world, uh, there I am with my mullet and all that uh, as a, uh, uh, I think I was probably a senior that year. Uh, this is in the school yearbook for the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry um, at Syracuse, New York. And it, it, it's an ironic photo that I want to share with you because they had me pose to look at the tree rings of this log, this dug fir log that was going around this country, an old growth dug fir log. And at that time, I really disliked tree rings. I was not interested in them at all, but I just happened to be there when a photographer was there and they asked me to do this. And so there are certain things that come along when you get introduced as being a, uh, someone associated with Harvard. And I wanna start here because this is how I view myself. Someone who grew up outside, either at this farm or a lot of times in the Adirondack Mountains um, in Northern New York State. And then this guy is an undergraduate who was thrilled about learning um, everything he could about trees. And yeah, that's, that's who I perceive myself in still today. But it was a short nine years later, after I had done my master's degree uh, at Auburn University in Alabama and worked a couple years in South Georgia, when I got a, a job working as a tree ring scientist of all things, surprisingly, after I had marked timber for a year in Northern Vermont, I got a job as a tree ring research technician for the late Gordon Jacoby and, and Roseanne Dirigo, who's very much alive and active, um, to work on this project in Mongolia. The idea was to reconstruct climate using tree rings. And even though I had been there in 1998, I come back to this tree quite often because it really uh, shook my world about what I understood about trees. I had, as I had said, I had marked timber for the prior year, well, 1997 and 1998. And I was thought of myself as an active uh, working forester. And when we cored this Siberian pine at high elevation tree line in central Mongolia, I was really shocked. Um, this tree is at least 600 years old. And what's really amazing about it is that uh, when you pulled the core sample out of the tree, you could see that its growth had accelerated tremendously in the last. 50 to 100 years. We didn't know exactly in the field when, but I would say last 50 to 100 years. And this was really important because in forestry, you know, I had been taught that old trees can't grow fast. They're like humans. They slow down as they get old. And this tree was doing just the opposite. And when you look at this tree, you can see that it was definitely um, a very healthy tree at one point. Here's the crown up here. It had died back due to some event, probably something in the 1800s, I would guess, maybe a cold, dry spell, something harsh, killed back the canopy. Only part of the cambium was alive, but then it grew back. And then it's not, uh, on this side of the tree, it doesn't look so healthy, but that is a very healthy canopy. 
for 10,000 feet in elevation. And that was a tree that really shook me to make me think, start thinking differently about trees. And before we go on, I want to introduce here on the left, this is Dr. Bhatta Balig Nachin, uh, who's a professor and director at National University of Mongolia. And on the right, this is Dr. Uh, Oyun Sana Biembasaren, who's now high up in uh, managing resources, natural resources for the government of Mongolia and with a particular interest in preserving and identifying old growth forests. I'm really thrilled. But this is 1999. Within a year, less than that, I start my PhD uh, at Lamont Doria Earth Observatory in Southern New York State. And I wanna take what I had learned on this project in Mongolia and apply it to trees in the East United States, particularly Southern trees near Northern range margins. And this is Prospect Mountain in Lake George, New York. This is Erica Mashig, who was my uh, research assistant, one of my research assistants in the lab. And she came up to core these trees with me. And it was interesting because when I was getting permission to core these trees, the managing forester said, why do you want to core these trees? They're only about 90 years old and this place has been burned. And, and I said, well, I'm, I'm interested in the climate response of these trees as you approach a northern range margin so we can understand how they might respond to climate change in the future. It was a bit of a shock that this white oak here on the left was 320, um, 340 years old right here. And this shagbark hickory, well, I don't know if it was this shagbark hickory, but this population of shagbark hickories were 125 to 225 years old. And you'll see later on, they are not big trees. And so when I saw those trees, again, they made me think differently about ecology and trees and a lot of different things. Further along during my dissertation, I kept coring up and down the Eastern United States. And this is in uh, Northern New Jersey. This is Nivan Manhopton Ahmed. She's a, uh, she, at this time, she was an undergraduate uh, working on her senior thesis, but she was also helping me as a research technician. And we went in to sample some Atlantic white cedar northern, near the northern range margin, just on the other side of this slope to the left. And on the way out, after we had sampled, we saw these crooked, weird chestnut oaks and smooth bark and I said, Niv, we should core these trees. They might be at least 200 years old. Well, the tree on the right is over 400 years old. It's a chestnut oak. And there's another one in this forest that's still alive today that dates to the 1570s. Um, probably is a little bit older than that. It's going to be 450 years soon. And uh, Miv is, I'm going to guess she's about 5'9 or 5'10. It's not, you know, it, this is not a terribly big tree. And just seeing this architecture of trees was really just like popped another light bulb in my my mind because I thought these trees were maybe 200 years old. Uh, some of them were, some of them were 300, 350. Um, the oldest ones, there were three of them at that time that were uh, 425 to 430 years old. And I continued on, this is down in central Virginia. This is in George Washington National Forest. An old, a patch of old growth that I was led to. And there's Sana on the right, the undergraduate in Mongolia that helped us on the that old 600 year old Siberian pine I showed you just a second ago. And Ashley Curtis, um, who was a uh, research technician in the lab at that time, and they volunteered to come down to help me core this old growth forest. And that's a tulip poplar on the, on the left that they're coring. And those tulip poplars were, I think, about 340 years old, the oldest ones. Um, the upper tree on the right is a uh, northern red oak, and you see this powder bark color, like someone threw sh powdered sugar on this tree. Um, I don't remember how old this one was, but I think it was over 200 years old. It was fairly large, but it's this tree, well, not this tree, this species on the lower right that I want to talk about. Um, I cored one day with Sana and Ashley, but then I went back another time um, because there were more tree species that I wanted to investigate in this stand. And I kept going back and forth across this very tiny watershed. And I passed this cucumber magnolia twice. And the third time I passed it, I said, okay, I got to core this tree. I cored it. Turns out to be 300 and I want to say 400, 347 years old, which at the time, only for about a year, was one of the old, it was the oldest documented cucumber magnolia ever. 
and I want to pause right there and say, uh, I, at that moment, I sampled the oldest tree, not because I knew what I was doing. Uh, I knew it looked kind of old, but I didn't really know what I was doing. But I, I happened upon the oldest tree, the oldest cucumber, magnolia, because not many people had cored it and really studied it. And so this forest, especially the mag cucumber magnolia in this stand, made me start to realize maybe we don't know how old trees live. And I'm going to tell you that still holds true oof, almost 20 years later. So I finished my dissertation in 2005. I start as an assistant professor at Eastern Kentucky University in the Department of Biological Sciences. I get a nice email from uh, Beverly James of Floor Cliff in September 2008. I still have that email, Beverly. This is literally copied word for word. And she writes, I realize you're probably very busy, but if you had a time to walk around the preserve to talk about the project and give me some suggestions, I would really appreciate it. Right now I have been flagging some trees. I may be interested in coring and coming up with a list of ideas of why I would even want to do this. And that's really just such a beautiful last line um, because I had been in this forest before and I think Beverly knew that. I was working with Troy Evans, who was a master student at that time. And we did a qu quick little hike along the upper ridge in Flora Cliff. And I looked down and I was like, yeah, it's a nice forest. I don't think there's anything too old about that. And so she's reaching out to a professor, would you want to come do this? And uh, it shouldn't be a big ask, but you can see she kind of thought about it that way. Um, and what she didn't know about me at that time is, as you saw in my, the second slide, is that I'm a very local guy in the sense, very local person. I like to be a part of my community, local community as best I can, and, and to do service projects and to help people out. Um, and especially if you want to talk about old trees, I will help you out best I can. And so I said to myself, I said, nah, I'll go do it. You know, this is interesting. It's a nice place. It's close by. I'm happy to do it. Was the next the third point so I cut out some of the email she said Beverly says the third point is a bit ambitious but something I've been thinking about our literature says that the ravines along Elk Lick Creek were never extensively logged uh, but select trees were cut during times of flooding this area is my main target for the project and there are certainly some trees that stand out and you can see here's a picture of Beverly in, in October 2008 with a really outstanding tree and again i was like i don't think there's so much there but i'm gonna you know she thinks that there's a little clue there sure let's go see what there is and so just a couple weeks later um there's beverly this is october it might be late september but I, it might it's probably october we went to core just a few trees just a handful of trees and this is the first one that beverly brought me to and it it makes sense it's a it's a chinkapin oak. It's a fairly large chinkapin oak. And I didn't know anything about chinkapin oak at that time. I really had trouble identifying them for at least a year after I got there, maybe two years after I got down in Kentucky. I hadn't lived with them much, I guess you would say. And so she brought me to this tree and I looked up and I don't have a picture of the crown that's worthwhile. And I said, ah, this is a wolf tree. They're usually open grown. They're fast growing. This, this probably won't be very old. Uh, well, you know, we get the core out of the tree and I'm like, uh, I can't see the rings, but you know, it's a wolf tree and uh, maybe it's old, maybe it's 150, maybe it's 200 years. It was 372 years old. And so that's like, that's another tree that says, hey, you got to be careful about what you're thinking because you don't know much. And I'm going to tell you still today, I don't know much. And that tree was really like, whoa, I got to think about this a little bit different. But of course, the tree that we cored that very same day that made me think, that like knocked me in the head in a nice way and said, you better think differently about things, uh, was the tree on the left. At the time we called it the one. Um, I think its nickname now is Woody Guth tree. Woody C. Guth tree. C stands for carbon, is that right? Anyways, uh, that's a 400 year old round. At that time it was like 398 years old and I had no idea that chinkapin oak was that slow growing in that environment in Kentucky. And so I had no idea that I just cored a 400 year old tree. And so 
yeah, all that experience, Mongolia up and down the East United States taught me something, but not everything, not by any means. But I want to talk about this tree on the right because you can see the wiggly nature of it right there. And this is tree 16. I don't remember it from that moment, of course. I remember it because I labeled this photograph tree 16 <laughs> 12 years ago. That's how I remember. Anyways, this skinny, once I realized how old these trees were in Florida Cliff, the, the Chicopin Oak, and they're 200, 300, 400 years old, once I recognized where they were and how they were growing, then I started to realize a little bit more about trees. And it was uh, Dr. Ryan McEwen, who's now a professor at the University of Dayton, went out in the field and helped us in October 2008 to CORE here. He's a native of Kentucky and, uh, you know, he's local. He's from Paris, or just outside of Paris, by the way. Uh, oh, I forget which little town he's from, but it's right next to Paris, Kentucky, lovely place. And uh, he said, how do you know this is an old tree? And I just went, dun, 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 dun. So I had learned something, but especially it was that floor cliff. And so he said, you should write that down. And I said, oh, really? Okay, yeah, I'll write it down. And I turned it into this little paper, the last one I submitted uh, when I was a faculty member at Eastern Kentucky University. And I'll tell you just some of the tricks uh, right now, nothing guaranteed of what I look for when I look for old trees. And the first thing I think about is what does the bark look like? And this is, these are two images of white oak. And these are, to me, classic white oak bark. On the right is a very fast growing 90, 80, 120 year old uh, or younger white oak. On the left, it's a little more blocky. You don't have those plates peeling off. And you know that could be 150 to 200 years old. I'm not gonna put an actual number on it, but like just a little bit older, not terribly old. But it, it's this bark when I think about white oak. When I go to want to go find an old tree, this is one of the clues. And this is uh, Dr. Alex Dye. He uh, works for the U.S. Forest Service out in Oregon now. And this is a part of a project we worked on. This is in New York. But this is very smooth bark uh, for a white oak. There's some bald patches up here on the left. And on the tree on the right, you can see this flash of white. And there are some ridges and furrows, but it's really a smooth looking tree. That's an old looking tree. The white oak in this forest were 200 to 350 years old. Here's uh, northern red oak. This is a 150 year old individual. This is classic ski slope bark, uh, northern red oak, very fast growing tree, a large tree. This one is actually uh, not terribly old. Here's one that's much smaller. This is in uh, Massachusetts on the north side of a ski slope, actually on a mountain. And uh, this is the oldest known population of Northern Red Oak. Dr. Dave Orwig of the Harvard Forest and others explored this population. We went back and resampled. This is a red oak. And the first time I saw, I almost said, this is a white oak, but it, it's not. It's a Northern Red Oak. We saw the leaves and everything. And they're over 300 years old. It's truly amazing. So bark is a good clue. When it gets a little bald, when the, the furrows slough off, that's a good indication that it might be an old tree. Here we are back in Floor Cliff, and there's Beverly James. And th another trait that I look for is low stem taper. So if the diameter down low on this tree on the left, it doesn't change too much until you get up into the upper canopy. That's a good indication that you're in a uh, you're in the presence of an old tree. So if, if if the structure of the tree looks more like a telephone pole than you know a young conifer. Uh, you know, Christmas tree like that. And uh, I love showing this one. Beverly, you're in a lot of my talks. Um, because there you are cranking really hard on this, on this chinkapin oak and it's 340 or 48 years old. It's not a big tree. Size does not often equal age. And uh, the next characteristic is, uh, um, hmm. Yeah, sinuosity. Oh, I haven't given this talk in a while. Sinuosity. And so there's tree 16 in the center from Flora Cliff. And here's uh, Blanton Forest Chestnut Oak. These are really wily, plastic looking oak trees. Um, the oak in Blanton Forest is uh, three, at that time it was 339 years old, I think, somewhere around there, maybe 349. 
most of the trees dated to the 1660s, 1670s, not all of them, but the chestnut oaks and the white oaks. But this twisty shape, the sinuous shape uh, of trees is, is really a good clue that it, it's been struggling in the understory, is, that's my interpretation, for quite a while. Um, it even happens with trees that we are told that are straight looking trees like tulip poplar. Uh, here's one in New Jersey that's twisting and turning all over the place. This is one in Kentucky on the right. Uh, Adrian Cooper, my master student, nicknamed this one, hello sunshine. It's just a tree that she loves so much. And look at that twist. This is not what you see in the textbooks. And this is a good characteristic that these trees have been struggling with competition and might be old. Um, this trait, this characteristic, is what I would call celery top. So what you do is, if you look up into the canopy of the tree, it only has a couple branches, like here. And on the tree on the right, this again is floricliff, just a few big branches in the top. And so it's like you brought a celery stick home from the grocery store. And it's a stout uh, vegetable with just a few leaves on top. So if it only has a few leaves and a few branches, that's probably a slower growing tree. And if it's relatively large, it doesn't have to be huge, but relatively large, there's a chance that it could be an old tree. There's a few other traits, a few specific ones. If you just Google external characteristics of old trees, a, this paper will pop up. You can download it. It's written for everyone. Uh, and there's, there's just a handful of other trees, but those are the basics. Let's talk about tree rings and what tree rings can do. And uh, I like starting on this slide um, this is a slide of the things we can detect in the environment from tree rings. Um, in the upper left, this is you know, the advance or the retreat of glaciers. Trees can be dated and tell us when that happens. This is a large uh, volcanic eruption. It can change the temperature of the earth for a year or two, certain ones, and we can detect those in tree rings in a variety of ways. Fire scars uh, are picked up on trees and we can date those and we can tell when fires occurred in the past. This panel with the wiggly lines in the lower left is about um, jet stream and the, the, uh, the delivery of moisture from the Pacific Ocean to the Pacific Northwest. We can tell when it's more predominantly up in the north or in the south. It's complicated but we can do those things. It's pretty amazing. And this is the late Gordon Jacoby again uh, getting a chainsaw sample from redwoods sitting on uh, uh, earthquake fault. And so if trees are sitting on an earthquake fault and they, there's an earthquake, they get really shook and we could detect the patterns of tree rings and we can identify earthquakes in the past. And so that's all geoscience. There's whole other, I mean, we could spend an hour just talking about what we can do with tree rings, but we don't have that much time. We have 15 minutes, I think I'm gonna go over. And so uh, this is the case study that really set dendro uh, up in the general public's mind. This is from the 1920s, A. E. Andrew Ellicott Doug Douglas, A. E. Douglas and other people at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Um, they dated these timbers. You can look it up, the Talkative Trees in National Geographic Magazine. They dated these timbers and they actually found that the Pueblos that lived in this area uh, were building regularly over time and then suddenly they stopped building. And the idea is they, they left town, they moved. And why that is, is maybe still somewhat controversial, maybe not, but it occurs with a severe drought. But this made National Geographic Magazine, I, I should know the year by now, but I think it's 1920s. Um, and this really put us on the map in a sense. Of course, people way before then, recognize patterns in tree rings and understand you could learn something from tree rings going all the way back to Greece and 322 BC. Uh, da Vinci actually looked at some tree rings and he said, oh, look at how those rings change in width over time. That's probably precipitation. And there's a reason he's a genius. Um, and A.E. Douglas who was really moving into Arizona in 1904 where he formalized cross-dating, which I'll talk about in a second, that really established or formalized our science, but there's many people before him uh, that identified this. And I, I emphasized him for a second because you see uh, mostly men here. Uh, and I, I'm sure I would guarantee if we could go 
deeper into the history books, we could find one or two women for each time period who were saying and observing and writing down the same things, because that's how it actually is. So I want to introduce you to someone really quickly. This is a tangent, but I think it's an important one. This is Dr. Florence Holly Ellis. Uh, she's what we would consider, at least in North America, the first female dendrochronologist, the first woman dendrochronologist. Um, she was actually a student of A.E. Douglas. And as it turns out more and more, um, A.E. Douglas uh, made some important advances in science, uh, but he was not kind to women and other people, let's say that. She never got her degree in dendrochronology because A.E. Douglas would not sign off on her dissertation. And because she is who she, she was who she is or she is who she was and all that, uh, she went on to become a very famous archaeologist, publishing more than 300 papers, which is just astounding in the early 20th century compared to today. The volume of research that's turned out today is dwarfs, it just overwhelms what happened in her time. She was amazing, she was a pioneer, she was brilliant, and she was an excellent dendrochronologist. A lot of her work was actually done in the Eastern United States very early, um, and she actually showed that there was a connection between tree growth and moisture availability. Even though it rains regularly and plentiful, uh, every month here in the East United States. And she's a real pioneer and I've just loved to talk about her because I've used some of her samples, she's done excellent work and, and she was really ahead of her time in, in, and as best as anyone else in the field at that time. She just never got the full credit she deserved again and again and again. What A.E. Douglas did advance is this method called cross-dating. And basically all it is is identifying the pattern of large and small rings through time and matching them between trees in a forest and then between trees in a region and giving us the ability to put exact calendar dates on each ring that we see in a tree. And so when people do radiocarbon dating or where they're looking at layers in, in uh, ice cores from glaciers, they can give you an age, but there's an error with it, plus or minus 50 or 100 or whatever it might be, depends. Um, if we do our work right, the error is zero. And we've proven this over and over again. Most recently, uh, labs from around the world have been shown to have agreed with each other on the dating of trees going back to the 700s. We can really do this stuff. We can put calendar dates on each trees. And that really sets our work apart. You can do it in corals. You can do it in otoliths, the, the bones and the ears of fish. You can do it in clams, and, and, and this is being applied to many other areas, um, but this is what sets us apart. We can do exact calendar dates, and that's really important. I don't think I'm gonna get into it too much, but a little bit here, if we zoom back to Mongolia, that picture I showed you when we were on the mountaintop with a 600-year-old Siberian pine, we were actually there to get cross-sections of old trees that were laying on the ground so we could make a long chronology, and I could tell you with pretty much absolute certainty that the center, the pith of this tree is 262 of the common era. So this sample had been probably laying on the forest floor for over a thousand years. We were able to take a cross section sample of it, bring it back to the lab, do our cross dating properly, go back in time from living trees to these dead woods and go back almost 2000 years. And this is kind of the visual representation of how we do that. So there's the 600 year old tree in Mongolia in the upper left, Siberian pine. There's Gordon and Fata Beleg uh, taking a cross section of a Siberian pine that's down on the ground. And we could take the patterns of rings like a, like a barcode from the living trees and then overlay them with the dead wood from the forest floor and go farther back in time. Now here in uh, the Eastern United States and other parts of the world, it rains too much, as I just mentioned, but it decays the wood quickly. And so we don't have many samples that sit on the forest floor for a thousand years. Yeah, it happens a little bit, but it's extremely rare. But what we can do is we can go into historic structures, take samples from those beams and go farther back in time. 
Uh, for example, Ed Cook has an oak tree ring record that goes back to the 1300s in Boston. It's truly amazing. And Megan Roshner, sorry if I mispronounced your name, Megan, uh, Dr. Megan Roshner at the University of Louisville. This is one of her many specialties and she's putting together great records for Kentucky right now using this approach. So uh, Dr. Arthur, Mary asked me uh, if I could talk a little about where we might be more likely to find old trees. So I wanna come back to Prospect Mountain. This is on the southeast corner of the Adirondacks. This is the view uh, on the, of the south side of the mountain. That's right, a snake cobble on the right, and there's the south slope. And so you're more likely to find old trees on south facing slopes. Uh, David Staley, Matt Thurrell uh, showed this in the Cross Timbers area uh, down in the, uh, the mid south, just west of you in Kentucky over in Arkansas, Texas, Oklahoma. Uh, but it works in the Northeast and most of the Eastern United States and probably lots of parts of the world um, on these steep southern slopes. And this is an example of why the foresters didn't think the trees were very old here. One was because there was a road to the top and um, there was a fort there, Revolutionary War. Go see, um, rent the movie Last of the Mohicans. I don't know if it's that good or not, but there's a scene, quote unquote, film from Rattlesnake Cobble. And I like to point that out. Uh, before they enter the fort. So that, uh, there, were war, there was a war here, uh, you know, battles here at Lake George during the revolution, the American Revolution. Um, there was a cog railway to the top. Um, there was a hotel on the top that burned down. And so like, why would there be old trees on this forest? So one, I told you already, because it was south facing, hotter, drier exposures tend to slow the growth of trees and make them less valuable for timber. And so here's the example. Here I am, oh, 2011, 2012, uh, sometime around then. And this is uh, with Benjamin Sweat, a photographer uh, out of New York City. We did a little article for Adir Adirondack Life magazine. And there I am on the left with a shagbark hickory that's 150, 170 years old. There's a sweet birch, Betula lenta, black birch, other people call it, it's got a lot of names. Um, not very large, and there I am against a white oak that maybe is 120, 150 years old. You can't tell how big I am. I'm 5'7", I'm not very tall. You know, I wrestled 119 in high school, so I'm not a big person. But, and, and neither are these big trees, but because of the south facing slope, hotter and drier and slower growth, but you can see all the rocks in the landscape very shallow soils, moisture limited, very slow growing. So these are extremely slow growing trees. And so there's not much of a reason to cut slow growing small trees when there's more productive land around you. And so these trees were kind of left. There might've been a sheep pasture or two, some sheep grazing, for sure there was likely something like that. But a lot of these trees, 175 or almost 200 years ago, were pretty much left alone. Now, when I moved to Kentucky, I had to think about things a little bit differently. Um, a lot of the mountain slopes, a lot of the mountain slopes that I looked on were cut pretty good. But what I soon learned, and if you look down here on the right, this is Casey Taggett, former master's student of mine at Eastern Kentucky University, emerging uh, down this slope. And this might be Cane Creek, some really beautiful uh, Eastern hemlock. There's some tulip poplar and there's some oaks in here. And in the Cumberland Plateau, you need to go down to find the old trees, not up on the upper slopes. So the Cumberland Plateau is pretty heavily cut. But when you come down on the benches on the slopes uh, coming off the Cumberland Plateau, down into a steep ravine, there's often old trees there. Some, uh, the, the bottoms of some ravines, if the access is highly restrictive, like if you can't get up into the ravine from an without going over the cliff, uh, a lot of those places are either uncut or s selectively cut. There's a lot of old trees down in there. And that's what Kentucky, another thing that it taught me working in the Cumberland Plateau region is that I, I didn't look up, I had to look down to find these old trees. It took me a couple of years to figure that out. We'll get there eventually if you keep looking. One more place I wanna take you to to show you how universal this is. Um, uh, the picture on the left, is 
a talus slope early in the morning. They, the fog was so heavy, we couldn't see where we're going. This is in Northwest Spain, Asturias, it's called. Um, and Dr. Mario, uh, Dario Martin Benito uh, was leading us up there because he thought there might be some old trees there. And in fact, there's the talus slope that we saw in the previous one. It's really massive in size and it's heavy. And when it's wet, it's very dangerous to walk across. There's a, actually a path, you can't see it in this image, but there's a path across that. Um, but this is not a physical barrier, I think that would limit um, serious forestry up on these high mountains up in Northwest Spain. But it wasn't that that really convinced me that we were going to an old growth forest and to the consternation of my host, I took over 200 pictures that morning because I saw this. And these trees brought me right back to that place in Northern uh, New Jersey with the 300 and 400 year old chestnut oaks. These oaks, this is Quercus petrea, Cecil oak. These trees have the same shapes as what I saw in Northern New Jersey, absolutely the same shapes. And I was like, oh my God, this is an old forest. And, um, and I think the reason they're not caught, besides being um, high up in a mountain and different ac difficult access, is that they are also uh, not highly desired by forestry. Who, how could you make timber out of those trunks? So they get bypassed. So maybe this has been thinned, but there are a lot of trees that look like that. And I'm happy to report that I think it's this tree uh, is likely over 600 years old. One of the oldest uh, oaks in the Northern Hemisphere, not absolutely the oldest, but one of the oldest. We didn't get the center of the tree. It's like 570 or 590 years old where we have all the rings. We miss about six centimeters of wood. Definitely over 600 years old. Really phenomenal uh, tree. But the new phenomenon, especially for Quercus petrius, the sessile oak, is this new discovery we just announced last month in ecology in this national park, Aspromonte. That's my grandfather's Italian. Ah, uh, that was terrible, but I'm gonna go with it. And so in this mountainous region, steep slopes, even though there had been people there, all the traits I've been telling you about where you find old trees, they have found They've documented what appears to be the oldest temperate oak ever. Uh, they did a radiocarbon of the inner piece of this one tree. They did five, they did five trees, I think, but this one tree dates, looks like it's maybe 900 years old, which is just astounding, which puts two or 300 years on the maximum known age of this species and oaks in general. And so that's where I say we're in our infancy infancy yes we're in our infancy about understanding how long trees live we really don't know we know for some species a handful of species for a lot of most of the species especially in the eastern united states, united states i'd say we don't have a clue so i'm going to wrap up here uh i think i've gone ooh, too long but we're gonna go two more slides beverly wanted me to talk a little bit about any insights I might have gotten from Floor Cliff from the oaks here. And this is a spaghetti plot. This is the raw ringlets of the chinkapin oaks. And you can see that the oldest trees were generally slower growing up into the 1800s. Growth increases. Why that is could be a combination of land use, climate change, it's hard to say, some very high growth, and then a decline slightly. But I wouldn't say it's decline. I shouldn't say that, but that's steady radio growth over the last century. And that was really interesting. But what's really interesting to me is this event here in the 1790s. This is a real dip in growth right here. And I don't know what it is. I'm gonna say it's probably an ice storm. I have other ideas. I'd rather not say them out loud. But this is after I normalized the data so you could see them all. So it didn't look like a spaghetti plot. This is ring width on the y-axis through time. And you can see that pattern of low growth, high growth, and then this dip out here in the late 1990s. That actually, I haven't come back to and try to determine what this is, but an ice storm wouldn't surprise me. And so these trees taught me a lot about the steadiness of tree growth. Uh, older trees that live a long time generally slow, were slower growing when they were young. And I think I'm going to leave it there because I've gone on too far. But uh, thank you for your your time and your attention. 
Um, there's my email address right here. If you have any questions, I'm happy to address them. Thank you so much. Thank you.